What's the creepiest unsolved mystery you know? About 1.5 years ago I was broken into. They stole essentially all my life savings which was in precious metals, along with a bunch of other misc personal belongings. The police never found them 3 days later, I see my door is broken in again, and thieves came back, and put a couple things back, including a gold ounce coin with a note, attached that my dad had written to me, when I was an infant, telling me he loved me. Less creepy just strange, criminals with a conscience. When I was sleeping at my grandma's house with my brother, someone knocked the one of two main doors that I was sleeping in front of, woke my bro up, hear the second knock. He yelled don't open the door, the third knock, then nothing, don't hear any more knock, in the morning, told everyone in the house, they all said it was nothing, but their face wasn't really good, I've read this three times, and I'm so confused about what you're saying, I feel like I've had a stroke, can you explain it to me, someone knocked on the door late at night and you didn't answer it, is that it? The body in boiler stack 9. Basically some maintenance workers found a well cooked body in the stack of a boiler in the steam plant at a paper mill. Nobody knows who it was, but there are signs that he died very slowly. He was found with his clothes off and wrapped around his feet and hands, as if to protect himself from the searing hot metal. The theory is that he was exploring during the weekend when the boiler was off, got stuck, and was unable to alert anyone before they started the boilers back up the following week. The body had been in there for months by the time he was found. The Beaumont children deserves a mention. Three kids in Adelaide, South Australia who went down to the beach in 1966 and never came back. They were seen talking to a man and then walking around the suburb, but that's it. Never came home, never found, nobody ever arrested, police still following tips and digging for bodies more than 50 years later. Kids were like 9, 7 and four. All three just vanished. Parents refused to move from the house for a very long time, in case they ever came home. Does my head in? Isn't he okay? Anthonette K. Adito's kidnapping. She let her kidnapper in after he said that he was Uncle Joe, where they threw her into a van. The creepy part is a year later, someone called 911 claiming to be her, and someone shouts in the background who said you could use the phone and a struggle is heard before the call cuts off. And Thanet's mom said that she was sure it was her daughter's voice. Then four years later, a girl matching Anthonette's description was acting strange in a diner and left a note on a napkin that said please help, call police. She's still missing, and she went missing in 1986. <laughs> Disappearance of the Sodder Children. Christmas Eve, 1945. The Sodder family home in Fayetteville, West Virginia burned to the ground. There's the father, George, the mother, Jenny, and nine children. Four of the children escaped, but five were believed to have died in the fire. Then, during the search of the burned house, none of the children's remains were found. The fire was nowhere near hot enough to burn through bone, but not a trace of them were found. Here's the freaky shit. Two months before, a visiting salesman told George his house would go up in smoke and your children are going to be destroyed. The salesman attributed this to George's dirty remarks against Mussolini. George, an Italian immigrant, had been outspoken against Mussolini, which angered some in his Italian-American community. Another visitor later told George that his fuse boxes would cause a fire someday. This was after George just had his electricity rewired and inspected to be safe. In the weeks before Christmas, the older Sodder children noticed a car following them through the main town as they walked home from school. During the night of the fire, Jenny was awoken by a strange phone call after midnight, asking for a name she did not know. At 1am, Jeannie heard a loud banging on the house's roof, but went back to sleep when she did not hear anything further. Half an hour later, she smelled smoke. The fire seemed to start near the fuse box. George, Jenny, and four of the children who had been sleeping downstairs escaped the house. They yelled to the children upstairs, but heard no response. The fire had already been engulfing the staircase, so they could not rescue them. George tried to go outside, around the house, to use ladder, to climb the window to the attic and rescue the children. But the ladder was not in its usual place. It would be found 75 feet away in an embankment. Then George tried to drive both his truck to the window, then climb them. 
but neither truck would start, despite both having worked the previous day. Later, a telephone repairman told the Sodders that the house's phone line had not been burned through in the fire, as they had initially thought, but cut by someone. The driver of a bus that passed through Fayetteville late Christmas Eve said he had seen some people throwing balls of fire at the house. Other witnesses claimed to have seen the children themselves. One woman who had been watching the fire from the road said she had seen some of them peering out of a passing car while the house was burning. Years later, in the 60s, Jeannie found in the mail a letter addressed to her, postmarked in Central City, Kentucky, with no return address. Inside was a picture of a young man around 30 with features strongly resembling Lewis, who would have been in his 30s if he had survived. On the back was written. Louis Soder I love brother Frankie I little boys a 90,132 or 35. The Sodders never stopped believing their children were alive, and Jeannie wore black in mourning every day for the rest of her life. A creepy one off the top of my head is the harassment of Bill and Dorothy Wacker, an elderly couple from Ohio. Their house had been ransacked a couple of times between 1984 and 1985. Then, in July of 1985, a stranger knocked on their door whilst Dorothy was home alone recovering from heart surgery asking to use their phone due to his car apparently breaking down. She thought he'd left after making the call, but then was knocked unconscious by a blow to the head. Dorothy woke up bound and gagged on the kitchen floor, but thankfully managed to crawl to an open window to get help from her neighbors, who called the police. Bill then returned home to find his revolver, among a few other things, had been stolen. This was accompanied by the message cheaper, but will do scrolled, in crayon on one of their walls. Four months later the revolver turned up on their porch in a bag. The harasser repeatedly phoned the couple, sometimes threatening them, and sometimes just breathing deeply down the phone like a fucking creep. Despite changing their phone number multiple times, they were unable to stop the calls. After this, they installed security lights. The harasser responded with a note saying, Your L-I-G-H-T-Z-R-A laugh. They were frequently left out the mocking and scary notes. Dorothy was then attacked once more in 1993, a full eight fucking years after the original attack, this time being sent to the hospital with skull lacerations. The whackers staked out their own house after this in an attempt to find the person who had been harassing them, however they didn't find anything. After the stakeout had been called off, they heard banging at the side of their house and found a note simply saying, get the message. After this, as far as I can recall, the harassment abruptly stopped. It really freaks me out. What motive would one have to harass a random old couple? For years and years. They never got close to finding out who did it, and both Bill and Dorothy died without ever finding out who made their lives hell. Andrew Goston. Smart boy who had a perfect attendance record skipped school to go to a train station to buy a one-way ticket to King's Cross in London on his own. As soon as he leaves the station, he seemingly vanishes in an area crawling with CCTV cameras. None of the CCTV cameras in the entire Etty of London had saved footage of him as the police waited two weeks before asking local businesses if there was any footage of him saved and there's no evidence of him ever leaving the city. There's theories he was groomed or got snatched off the street, but that's pretty much impossible to do in such a busy area. He had a PSP on him when he disappeared, but Sony confirmed no PSN account had ever been made on his account. He had no access to the internet at home and didn't even have a mobile phone. Strangely, he left the charger for the PSP at home, suggesting he possibly intended to come back. Amy Bradley. She was on a cruise with her family when she went missing. They only have suppositions on when exactly she disappeared, but it was on the ship, since the last sight of her was when the ship was en route to the Antilles. One of the theory is that she was sold to sexual slavery, but the details of her disappearance are really creepy. The fact she was taken in an enclosed space and nobody saw or found anything is baffling. Also the ship's crew were quite uncooperative first with the family and then the FBI, leading some people to think they had a kind of deal with a sex ring. Amy had told to her parents the night prior her disappearance that she was creeped out by some cruise members who were insistent for her to go with them on shore in Curacao. I'm not sure about that, but the fact is, her case is really sad. Some tourists have claimed to have seen her on the shore months later, malnourished and terrified with two men next to her. 
as of right now, it's been 21 years, and she's still missing. I remember a story, sadly I don't recall any names, but it was slash is quite a well known story, where a German dude disappeared. So, this guy is on vacation with his friends. One night he gets in a fight with some guys at a club. His friends assumed they were Russian but weren't sure, as they were really drunk. Dude goes outside to get some fresh air. His friends follow him, when he wasn't returning. They find him, outside, with a head injury. Apparently the guys from the club, returned with some friends to beat him up. The next day he visits a doctor, and is diagnosed with a small ear injury. He isn't allowed to fly, and gets some medicine. He delays his fly home for a week, or so, but not his friends. Now this is where the story gets strange. For the next days this dude sends paranoid messages to his mother and friends. Telling them he feels weird, that something is strange, and that he is watched and followed by someone. In one of his last messages, he asked his mother to google the medicine the doctor gave him. On the day of his departure he was filmed and seen at the airport. He was approached by security, I don't know why, and brought into a room. Security later said, he was really nervous and always looking around, as if he was expecting to be followed. Suddenly he went into a full panic, and stormed out of the room, leaving his backpack and all his belongings behind. Security footage showed him running out of the airport, across the street, and into the open fields. That was the last anybody has seen of him. Why I get horny? My favorite is probably John Lang's case. Basically a local activist posts regularly about the Fresno Police Department, and about how they were plotting against him. People thought he was crazy, until he set up a camera, that recorded lots of weird shit. Including a bunch of cops parking across the street from his house staring at him in the middle of the night and a van pulling up with a large camera that people theorized, took thermal pictures through walls to see if anyone was inside. He posted that that weekend, the police was going to murder him, and accurately predicted his death. The police released a report saying that he was stabbed repeatedly in the back, and then recanted saying it was supposedly a suicide of a crazy man. The Mary Celeste is one of my favorites. In November of 1872, the American brigantine Mary Celeste set off from New York for Genoa, Italy, with 10 people aboard. Nearly a month later, a British ship spotted the Celeste adrift some 400 miles east of the Azores, an archipelago off the coast of Portugal. Save for a few feet of water in the hold, the ship was perfectly undamaged and still contained six months worth of food and water. The cargo was not a shade and the crew's belongings were still in their quarters. However, not a single soul could be found on board. One of the lifeboats was missing, but the crew was never seen again. Multitudes of explanations have been offered, particularly after an investigation at the time, found no evidence of foul play. Today, the fate of the Mary Celeste remains largely a mystery, pirates probably would have left the ship in a worse state, and mutiny seems unlikely to historians. I don't know about you, but my money is on sea monsters. The story of Johnny Gosh always had a lot of people scared in Des Moines, Iowa. In 1982, 12-year-old Johnny Gosh disappeared while on his paper route. All that was left was his bag and wagon. The city police refused to investigate the disappearance for several days. A few months later his mother, Marine Gosh, sets off a massive search and campaign to find Johnny. He was one of the first kids on the milk cartons and she would take out ads in papers all over neighboring states. She received a call a few months after the disappearance that someone had seen Johnny in Oklahoma, but was taken away by two men. According to Noreen, in 1997 at 2.30 am two men knocked on her door. She claims she recognized one of the men as her son who would now be 27 years old. He wouldn't tell her where he had been, or where he was going, only that he couldn't stay, he wanted her to know that he was alive. To this day she looks for her son nearly 37 years later, but she also has lead huge changes in finding missing children. There is also a documentary about Johnny on Amazon, who took Johnny. 